the oxygen haemoglobin association curve is one of the most important concepts in anaesthesia, ICU and emergency medicine. This is due to the odd characteristic of blood in that it exhibits cooperative binding. This means that as oxygen binds to unoxygen haemoglobin, it gets easier to bind subsequent molecules. The fourth molecule bound has a greater affinity for haemoglobin. We label the axis as percentage saturation of haemoglobin and the partial pressure of oxygen in KPA, but this can also be in millimetres of mercury or pressure of your choice. The first molecule, as we've said, is hard to bind, which explains this slower uptake at the start of the curve. It then becomes easier to bind, which explains this steeper part coming up now. And as the curve plateaus, this is because all the haemoglobin molecules are fully saturated. You can see that if we plot a 97% saturation line of arterial blood, um, it will meet the upper plateau part of the curve, and this will give a value of 13.3 on the KPA axis. We'll never truly get 100% saturations in arterial blood, that's why we use a 97% value. If we then plot a venous blood saturation line at 75%, we can see that it hits the steep part of the curve. This curve is obviously not linear, and therefore the percentage drop in the Y axis does not match the drop in KPA. On the x-axis. Just before we look at the KPA of venous blood, if we plot the P50 or 50% saturations value, it also hits a steep part of the curve and its KPA value is 3.5. So compare this to venous blood's KPA which is 5.3. They're not so different but very different to arterial blood's KPA. This explains why we get very concerned with what seem to be small changes in saturations. These drop in saturations can represent huge changes in the partial pressure of oxygen in the blood. So if we take a look at this aspect of the oxygen haemoglobin dissociation curve, we can see that it's quite steep. This steepness reflects the difference between 97, 75 and 50% oxygen saturations and the non-linear change in KPA. It is due to the cooperative binding we've already discussed and also due to allosteric modulation of haemoglobin, which means that when oxygen dissociates, that haemoglobin forms a tense state. But what would happen if the oxygen haemoglobin dissociation curve were to shift to the right or to the left? The way that I try to remember this is if the curve shifts to the left, the conditions in the body are quite analogous to the conditions found in the lungs. And if it shifts to the right, the body's conditions are quite analogous to conditions found in muscle. So factors that shift the oxygen haemoglobin association curve to the left facilitate the uptake of oxygen from the lungs and the P50 value is lower than 3.5 kPa. You'll see it in conditions that increase the pH, decrease temperature, decrease 2,3 dPg, decrease partial pressure of carbon dioxide, fetal haemoglobin, meth haemoglobin, carboxyhemoglobin, and stored blood. The reason I say that it is like the lungs is because if you imagine it's like the lungs, alkalotic due to low CO2 levels, lower temperature compared to the muscular parts of the body, it helps to remember the factors better. Lungs importantly facilitate the binding of oxygen to haemoglobin, so this also helps you remember that a shift to the left aids the uptake of oxygen and holding on to it. So factors that cause a shift to the right in the oxygen haemoglobin association curve are almost the opposite of factors that cause a shift to the left. So you can see it in an acidotic pH, increased temperatures, increased 2,3 dPg, increased partial pressure of CO2, sickle cell anemia, anemia, pregnancy and post acclimatization to altitude. So people sometimes ask about the Bohr effect, which is the right shift in the oxygen haemoglobin dissociation curve, i.e. favouring oxygen dissociation, where there is an increased PaCO2 or hydrogen ion concentration in the blood. The Bohr effect enables the body to adapt to changing conditions and makes it possible to supply extra oxygen to tissues that need it the most. For example, when the muscles are undergoing strenuous activity, they require large amounts of oxygen to conduct cellular respiration, which generates CO2 and therefore hydrogen carbonate and hydrogen ions as byproducts. These waste products lower the pH of the blood, which increases oxygen delivery to the active muscles. The other thing to mention is the double bore effect, and this refers to the situation in the placenta where the bore effect operates in both the maternal and the fetal circulations. The increase in pCO2 in the maternal intravillous sinuses assists oxygen unloading. The decrease in pCO2 on the fetal side of the circulation assists oxygen loading. The Bohr effect facilitates the reciprocal exchange of oxygen for carbon dioxide. The double Bohr effect means that the oxygen dissociation curves for maternal HBA and fetal haemoglobin move apart, i.e. there is a right shift maternal and left shift for the fetus. So just to emphasise again that this is a reciprocal process. 
the maternal side will favour oxygen unloading to the foetus and fetal CO2 will go to mum. The last thing to mention is the Haldane effect, which describes the increased ability of deoxygenated haemoglobin to carry carbon dioxide. The converse is true as oxygenated blood has a reduced capacity to carry carbon dioxide. The Haldane effect occurs because deoxygenated haemoglobin is a better proton acceptor than oxyhemoglobin. So to summarise the main points of the oxygen haemoglobin dissociation curve, cooperative binding is what gives the curve its shape. Right shift of the oxygen haemoglobin dissociation curve favours oxygen unloading. Left shift causes the haemoglobin to hold on to more oxygen. And small changes in saturations can equal big changes in the KPA.